Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 3 this morning. And when you find it, if you'll please rise, and as you do so, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness on the front side of this, as you'll see that there are many names, many of which I'm sure that I will pronounce wrongly, but nevertheless, we will make through it together as we look at God's Word to us from Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Elsali, the son of Nagai, the son of Mathah, the son of Matthias, the son of Samain, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonana, the son of Resha, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kazim, the son of Eldam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Elikayim, the son of Mele, the son of Menah, the son of Matah, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Dim, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sarag, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Harfax, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Amen. Thus far, the reading of God's Holy word, you may be seated. So I mentioned to you a few weeks back, I went home to my parents in northwest Iowa over Thanksgiving, and this was the place that I was born and raised until age eight, and it was the place that my grandparents lived the entirety of their life, and so we made occasional trips, but to be honest, I had not gone back in quite some time. So I had forgotten how connected everyone in that small town truly is and how everyone knows how everyone else is connected. And so, yes, they can tell you, oh yeah, that's John, he's the son of so-and-so and and he married Jane and she's the daughter of such-and-such and on it goes. And so I often joke with my parents that You need to be careful because the the gene pool seems to be getting quite shallow over there in northwest Iowa, and that their favorite game is what I like to call Dutch bingo, that in conversation they bring up names until there's a name that they both recognize, or better yet, they're both related to, and they go, bingo, I know that person, I'm related to them, that's my fourth cousin, and so when I went back, I had a lady that met me on the Thanksgiving service, and she said, oh, you're David and Marion's son. And I said, that's right. And then she said, oh, and your wife is a visser, right? And I said, no, that's my brother's wife. To which she was seemingly disappointed because no doubt she probably wanted to tell me that her mother was the third cousin twice removed or something of that nature. Maybe you come from a a small town like that, and you know that reality as well. Heritage is of great importance to them. It's a sense of belonging. And there has been a a great interest in recent days with genealogies, with Ancestry.com and 23andMe. And if that's you, that's, that's great. But for myself, I'm not that interested I'm not that interested in my genealogy, and I'm surely not interested in your genealogy, so please don't share it. And that's probably how many of you are as you come to this passage this morning. It's a list of names, 
name after name. Most of the names you have never heard of. And perhaps you thought, surely pastor is not going to preach on the genealogy. Oh wait, yes, yes he is, isn't he? And if you've ever wondered, are we truly committed to preaching expositionally, verse by verse, this is your answer. Yes, we are. But it's a reminder to us, isn't it, that all scripture is God-breathed and therefore God-inspired, and it is profitable. Now, that doesn't mean that all scripture is equally profitable, and surely not all of it is equally preachable, but all of it is given to us by God, and genealogies are no different. But the question might be asked, and surely is, but, but why? Why is this here? Why is it in the Bible? Why is this a part of the gospel accounts? What would Luke have us to know from this list of names? Well, there's actually great significance in it, and that's what I want to explore with you this morning. And so I want to see Jesus' family tree, first historically, and then second, theologically. First, Jesus' family tree historically. Luke, in many ways, over the first three chapters, has been laying out the foundation, perhaps more than any other gospel writer. Now, foundations aren't altogether exciting. Nobody walks into your home and says, wow, that's, that's quite a foundation you have here on your house. Yet without the foundation, you, you do not have a house, do you? Jesus says as much at the end of his sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, when he says that there was one man that built his house upon the sand and another that built his house on the rock. Foundations matter. You must be built on a firm foundation. That, that firm foundation is Christ. He is that rock. And what we see with who Jesus was and he is, is indeed he is that rock. He, he came from a firm foundation, and that is seen even in his genealogy. But first, perhaps a, a word about genealogies. This is not the only genealogy in the Bible. If you read through the Bible in a, a year, or if you've read through the Bible in its entirety, you know that. You're well aware of that. And oftentimes, if we're honest, the genealogies are, are a bit of a struggle. Recently, I, I read Esau's genealogy. I can't say that I gained a lot of devotional thoughts from that passage, but there it was. And there are about 40 genealogies throughout the Bible, which when you think about it, takes up a considerable amount of space. Written in a time when writing was costly. It was not written on just scraps of, of paper with a 10 cent Bic pen. No, it was written on scrolls. And you might think, well, surely these lists of names are, are not needed. No doubt modern editors would, would have cut them out because they would say these seemingly do not add to the story. They don't advance the, the narrative. But God had them to be included. Why? Well, in part, they demonstrate that God values two things. Oftentimes, that which we undervalue, especially in our day and age. And the first is order. God is a God of order and not confusion. We joke when we say that the Presbyterians' favorite verse is, let everything be done decently and in order. And that it takes, oftentimes, a, a lot of meetings. Sometimes my wife likes to joke that, that we have a committee to make up another committee that makes up another committee in order to establish what we are to do. And that's oftentimes the case. But what we see is that order is important in the economy of God. And what genealogies establish is proper order. It establishes proper order in regards to, to land rights, what tribe you belong to, and therefore what land did you inherit. It is also important in regards to responsibility. If you are the son of Levi, or if you are the son of David, those two lines were the lines of priests and the lines of kings. And so that 
you could say in, in Old Testament history, in Israel's history, the socio-economical and civil and even religious stability all required order. And that was provided by genealogies. Every Israelite would have known their genealogy. It would have quite literally been their birthright. Their, their rights, their, their privileges, their authority was all tied to it. In some ways, you could say it was their identification, much like we would have a, a driver's license or a passport today. This is who I am, and this is where I belong. And so when Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he, in a sense, is, is playing the, the Jewish game of, of who's who. He, he knew his identity. He knew his heritage. He knew where he came from, and that was true of every Israelite. And so that order was decent, or that order and descent was, was part of the decent order of God. Well, second, we not only see in the genealogies order, but we see history. The Bible is a history book. It's not its only purpose, of course, but that surely is a purpose, to be history. And, and for it to be history, it needs to be true history, which you would think would be a given, but we know that's not always the case, is it? That this history, the history of God, the history of God's people is rooted and grounded in truth. It's historically reliable, that the history of God's people is not a fable or a fairy tale. Rather, it's something that you see playing out over time and in time. And it's taking place through people, through people's lives. How do we know that? Well, we see them listed here, don't we? They're names that can be traced throughout time, throughout history. Now, Luke's intention is not to give every name between Jesus and Adam, because no doubt there are names and, and generations that are skipped, but you can trace the path. In fact, you can trace the, the path through different means and different ways. As you remember that Luke is not the only one that has a genealogy, but Matthew begins with a genealogy. And if you compare those two genealogies, there's, there's different names, which many critics of the Bible will point out. And so you might ask this morning, why the discrepancy between Matthew and Luke? Well, some scholars say that, that Matthew is tracing Joseph's line, and Luke is tracing Mary's line, and that they were both from the line of David, but took different paths to get there. And that would make sense because Luke got most of his material for Luke chapter 1 through 3 from Mary. But others say that Matthew is more concerned with the, the kingly line of Jesus, and Luke is actually more focused on the, the bloodline of Jesus. And so both of these arguments have legitimacy. I don't know that we can fully and finally know exactly why it is, but, but we know that they just weren't coming up with names randomly, that these genealogies were a part of the history of Christ. But like I said, history happens by and through people over a long time, over many, many years and decades and even centuries. That history is not shaped by, by squirrels and birds and cats and dogs as much as we may love them and great, are grateful for them. History happens by people. And God is working out his purpose through people. And some of those people are very significant people. As you read through this list, you, you probably kind of perked up when you're like, oh, I know that name. Adam and Enoch and, and Abraham and, and David and Joseph. But those were few and far between, weren't they? Most on this list, let's admit it, are no names. Yes, they perhaps had funny names, but that is all that you know about them. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they did or what they were able to accomplish or, or where they lived. There's nothing about them in the scriptures other than their name listed 
in a genealogy. And so therefore, from human history perspective, they are forgettable. But what does this genealogy show to us and demonstrate? That they're not forgotten by God. Maybe they're not significant enough to have their history recorded, but God was pleased to use them as a part of his history. In fact, a part of the the greatest revelation that he has given to mankind, the birth of his son. Now, did they know it? In part, but not as a whole. And so, in other words, they were living out their lives, and yet God was using them. And that ought to be an encouragement to us. Let's admit it, most of us, if not all of us, will be no names. Remembered by our children, hopefully remembered by our grandchildren, but probably not far beyond that. Will anybody have recollection of who we are or what we did or or where we came from? And perhaps that is a depressing thought to you, but it ought not be. Because if we're living our lives to the glory of God, it's not about us. It never is and it never will be. It's all for him. It's all done for him. It's all done for the advancement of his name. I heard recently that the number one career choice of elementary children is now to be a YouTuber. Which may be shocking, But I'm sure before that, before the intervention of of YouTube, it was for them to be an NBA player or an NFL player or an actor or an actress or the president of the United States. What does that always demonstrate? That that human nature wants to be a person of prominence, of notoriety. And yet, are we as the people of God content, living a peaceful and quiet life, the glory of God. If we're given positions of of notoriety, then so be it. Or if we're in positions of, of nothingness, again, would it not be about us, but would it be for him? And we must have that attitude of John the Baptist, that I must decrease, but he must increase. And what we see in part is that this list of names demonstrates that God used these individuals in his history. It's a bit of a cliche, but history is his story, isn't it? It is not ours. And so, therefore, every day that God gives to us belongs to him, and it counts for all of eternity. Now, it may not feel like it. When you are changing diapers... And when you are cleaning floors and you're dealing with problems or, or problem people at work, but when you give your life as a living sacrifice, that is always holy and pleasing to God. And God is using you, even if nobody else knows it. And so in part, we can read this 70 plus names on this list and go, that's right. God used Heli and Melchi and Nagai as a part of his history, his history. And he is using us in a similar way as well. Well, second then, we see Jesus' family tree theologically. Just like we desire notoriety, if you have or uh, are or have done genealogies, no doubt you're, you're doing that for a certain reason, and that reason is is no doubt to know your history and to know the path, but but secretly you're wanting to discover someone of significance, aren't you? That you were some great-great-grandson of some earl or duke, or that your relatives were the ones that crossed over on the Titanic and that they were the ones that survived, or that you were related to Thomas Jefferson or the Wright brothers or or George Carver Washington or, or somebody But I doubt that any of you would name the lowlights. You like the highlights, but not many of you would name the lowlights of your history. Not many of you would say, you know what, my my great-great-grandfather, yeah, he was a drunk. And my descendants, yeah, they were liars. They were fornicators. 
They were murderers. But yeah, that is what we read when we read Jesus' family tree, isn't it? It's not a pretty picture. Look at this list. Begin at the end with Adam. We know his sin, don't we? And it says that he had a son. His son was Seth. You remember that son was the replacement of Abel, who was killed by his brother Cain. We go on to read of Noah, who, yes, in faith, built the ark, but after he got off the ark, what did he do? He, he got drunk. He got very drunk, didn't he? And then we have Abraham, who lied about his wife, not once, but actually twice, called her his sister. We have Jacob, who's a deceiver and a manipulator and a thief. We have Judah, who is the ringleader of selling his brother Joseph. And then later on has a child, Perez, by his daughter-in-law, Tamar, who he thought was a prostitute. How many of the Ten Commandments, at least the the second table, were, were broken in that list? All of them. And we haven't even left Genesis yet. We could go down the line and and see all the things that these individuals were involved with. And again, the the scripture doesn't always portray a, a beautiful, sinless picture, does it? It's abundantly clear that Jesus came from a, a long line of sinners and covenant breakers. And it actually demonstrates the very reason that he needed to come. And I believe the, the very reason that Luke wrote this genealogy. See, I think you get his purpose at the very end. See, Luke wrote the, the genealogy backwards, didn't he? No other genealogy that I know of is, is written this way. Usually it starts with the, the past and it moves to the present. It starts with the oldest and, and moves to the, to the youngest. Usually you work your way down the family tree, not up the family tree, but not Luke. He starts with Jesus and he works his way back. How far back? Well, all the way back, doesn't he? Because the very end ends with the son of Adam, the son of God. See, whereas Matthew stops with Abraham, Luke goes all the way back to the beginning and he links Jesus to Adam. Because like all of us, Jesus was a descendant of Adam. We see that, don't we? That is not hidden from us. See, Adam might have died, but his sin nature surely did not. That sin nature was passed on. And so, yes, we could read this as a whole list of names, or we could read this as this one was a sinner who gave birth to another sinner, who gave birth to another sinner, who gave birth to a lawbreaker, who gave birth to a covenant abdicator. That is at least until we come to Christ. Yes, he was from the line of Adam, but there was a break, wasn't there? There's a a kink in the link, as we would like to say. And Luke makes that abundantly clear. Why? Because how does he begin? Verse 23, Jesus, when he was beginning his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son of as was supposed of Joseph. See, we know that Jesus actually wasn't the son of Joseph, was he? He was the son of Mary, but not of Joseph. Rather, he was the son of God. In fact, Luke has shown this to us quite clearly, hasn't he? We remember we had that testimony of when he was 12 years old and he was in the temple. And what is it that Jesus said to his mother? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? His father not being Joseph, but his father being God. And then again last week, we hear at his baptism, the voice that came down from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And so Jesus did not have a sin nature. He did not have the sin nature of his earthly father. Rather, he had the sinless perfection of his heavenly father. And that is why Luke writes at the end that this one was the son of Adam, the son of God. That yes, Adam was a son of God. That is made abundantly clear. 
that he was made perfect. He was made spotless. But Adam, as we know, sinned. And that is why we needed a second Adam. We needed a second son of God. And as we will see next week in chapter 4, we see that this son of Adam, this son of God, did not sin like Adam sinned. That he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. And so what Luke is trying to put forward to us this morning is that Christ is the new Adam. As Paul will say in Romans chapter 5, the first Adam brought us sin and death, but the second Adam brought us life and righteousness. That is why Luke painstakingly lays out this genealogy, because he wants to link Jesus to Adam, but he wants to show that this is the the new Adam. And you remember the, the name Adam simply just means man. So if you want to simplify this genealogy, you should read Jesus, and then you have this whole list of names, but at the very end you see that Jesus is the the son of Adam or the son of man, the son of God. That is who he is. That Luke is demonstrating for us perfectly that he is both fully man and fully God. And that's what will be demonstrated in the next 20 chapters of Luke. And so you see that this is incredibly good news. Yes, there is even gospel news to us in the genealogy. Because if God did not send his son to be the son of man, to be the son of God, then all that we would have, all that we would have is a history of sin and death. And if that is all that we had, then I would say to you that we have no hope. In fact, I would go as far to you as saying, you know what? Stop having kids. Don't pass your sin nature along. Let this poor, miserable place come to an end. Don't pass it along. You're only passing along sin and death. But with Jesus coming, he rewrites history, doesn't he? He gives us a history of life, not of death. He gives us a history of of hope and not of despair. That there is truly no hope outside of the gospel. That this earth without Jesus would just be a few thrills on the merry-go-round of death. That's all it would be. But in Jesus, there is true and everlasting hope. In fact, there's life. Life everlasting. If you had to pig me down and and ask me, Pastor Joel, what is your favorite verse? I would probably tell you that the the entirety of the Bible is is all my favorite verses, but but there is a particular favorite verse, and that is John 10.10, where Jesus says that the, the thief, which is Satan himself, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And you know what? He almost did, didn't he? He almost got away with it. He almost destroyed this earth all the way down and took away any hope that we would have, any hope of life. But Jesus can say, that's what the thief came to do. But I came that you may have life, and life abundantly so. See, if Christ didn't come, all we would be is sons of Adam, sons of the devil, sons of death, and sons of dust. But what do we read in the New Testament? We read Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Do you hear what that is saying? Do you hear how much hope is in that verse? what our new reality is now in Christ, that we are now adopted as sons, adopted as sons and adopted as daughters. Now, remember, women, when he says that we're adopted as sons, that is not a slight to you. Remember that all of the inheritance would go to the son. So for you to be called a son is to say, I have all the inheritance of Christ. I have all the blessings that he would give to me. They are given fully to me as his son, as his child. So in Jesus, what we're saying this morning is that we have a new family tree. 
We have a spiritual family tree. And that we're united together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That we become the family of God. Isn't that what we saw this morning? Yes, we're bringing a family in. Yes, we're dedicating these children through the baptism, through the sacrament of baptism. But what we are saying is that these belong to us. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that what Jesus said when they came to him and said, your, your mother and your brother are waiting outside? What does Jesus say? It wasn't a slight to his mother and brother, but he's saying that there is a new reality at place. He says, who are my mother and my brothers? And he goes, here, here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother, he is my sister, he and she is my mother. That our family, spiritual family, is thicker than our blood family because our biological family is, is temporary. Our spiritual family is, is eternal. That the, the blood of Christ is, is thicker than, than blood, right? And that's what Paul will say as well, that he came from the tribe of Benjamin, that he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. But then he'll go on to say, but, but all of that is rubbish in comparison to knowing Christ. So you have a greater connection with brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in Christ, oftentimes than your actual brothers and sisters. As you're adopted into your spiritual family where you have life and find life. And so through this spiritual family, we have eternal life. Life. We, we are no longer passing on just the, the legacy of death, are we? Or rather, we are passing on the, the legacy of life. And so we can say with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is the power of that sin, of the power of the law? But what does he go on to say? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is a passage that we oftentimes read at funerals, but that is our reality now, isn't it? Right now in Christ Jesus, it is for all who are in Christ. And so Luke, a, a Gentile, wants to make sure that it's clear that Jesus isn't just a Savior for Jews, not just a Savior for those that are a part of his biological family. He's a Savior for all mankind. That he is the savior of sinners, past sinners, present sinners, and future sinners. But sinners that are now rooted in Christ through faith, adopted into the, the family of God. So if this family tree went on past Christ, let me ask you this morning, would your name be on it? Can you trace your lineage, not to your, your father and grandfather and great-great-grandfather, as good as that is, but can you ultimately trace your spiritual family back to Christ? Because you weren't necessarily born from it, from natural birth. Although God uses families, as we saw this morning. But he passes on his covenant promises through his Holy Spirit so that you and I can ultimately say, yes, we are, we are born again. We have a spiritual birth through Jesus Christ. I will end with this. In this passage, we see that repeated word, son of, son of. So-and-so was a son of this and a son of that. But that word son is actually implied in the, in the Greek. It just literally says of. So this one was of this one, of that one, of the other. And so what we can substitute is that this one was a, a, a child of, a child of this person, a child of that person. And isn't it special then that God chose for us to be sons of, daughters of, children of, so-and-so, so that those bi biological relationships would show a, a much greater relationship that our biological relationships would, would be a reflection of a, a much greater and more grand relationship that all of us would, would ultimately know a far greater father than our earthly father. And that all of us 
would be a far greater child than a child of our earthly parents. Rather, we would be a child of God, that we'd be adopted into the family through Christ, that we'd receive the eternal inheritance, that we'd receive life forevermore. It's almost too good to be true, isn't it? And yet it is ours in Christ. And so, yes, Jesus was the son of Adam, the son of God. And through Christ, we are made sons through his grace and by his mercy. See, what we should read in this is the the family tree of Jesus, yes, but it's the family tree by grace of you and of me. Amen. Join me in prayer. Lord, what a privilege it is to be called sons, that we can call you Abba, Father, and that is what you are through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, what a, what a precious gift it is to be called children of God. Lord, as we, we saw the, the ministry of our children this morning, through the sacrament of baptism, through the children's choir, Lord, Lord what, what affection we have for these children. And, and yet, Lord, how much more do you have affection for us as your children? How much more do you love us because you are a perfect father? You are an infinite father. And therefore, your infinite love is given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, what a privilege, what an honor, what a blessing. And Lord, we've only just begun. This is just a foretaste. The greater days are yet to come when we will truly join together as your completed family of the saints past and present and future that are brought together in the new heavens and the new earth. What a family reunion that will be. And what a blessing it will be for us in Christ. Lord, we thank you this. All in Christ, our Savior's name.